Thanks a lot for coming, you guys. Um, we have our guest today, Donnie Eichar. He's an award-winning director, producer, and author. Um, Dead Mountain, Donnie's first book, examines the Dyatlov Pass incident, a mystery that has confounded, confounded investigators and inspired speculation for over 50 years. As the first author to retrace the Dyatlov hikers' fateful footsteps in 1959, the first person outside of Russia to go to the Dyatlov Pass in the winter, and the first person to extensively interview Yuri Yudin, the only surviving hiker before his death earlier this year, ICAR takes readers through gripping unpublished material and photographs, extensive exclusive interviews, first person investigations, and finally reveals the true story of what happened at Dead Mountain. In addition to Dead Mountain, ICAR recently produced 18 episodes of the groundbreaking MTV documentary series, The Buried Life. He and his team took the show from the front page of the New York Times to Oprah's couch and shooting hoops with President Obama. Uh, come help me welcome Donnie to Google. Glad to be here. So tell us, Donnie, how did you become interested in this case overall? Well, uh, about four years ago, I was uh, writing a project in Idaho, a scripted project, and um, <coughs> I was actually procrastinating, which I know none of you guys do here, but, um, and I happened upon this story. And what really intrigued me right off the bat was how was it that a group of very experienced hikers left a perfectly good tent and walked a mile away from the tent, barely, you know, not sufficiently clothed without the proper footwear and walk to basically certain death. So that central question is really what pulled me in. And then as a documentary filmmaker, I thought, what about the hikers? We're talking nine hikers here. Originally there was 10. Um, who are they? What's their story? So I also wanted to get their story as well. Nice. When did you decide that you, you had to go to Russia to actually study this? and? further your investigation? Well, um, I should go back and explain the story really quick, just in, in quick story beats. Um, in January 1959, the, the height of the Cold War, there was a group of hikers that set out, most of them were university students, and they were setting out for an expedition in the northern Ural Mountains. <laughs> Midway through the trip, there was one hiker named Yuri Yudin who turned back due to an illness ever knowing he wouldn't see his friends again. So two weeks later, um, the hikers never return. So they send out a rescue team and a search team to investigate their disappearance. And they find the tent at the, the campsite, but the tent is intact. All their clothing, all their boots, everything inside, even there's even food sitting there that was uneaten, is still intact but there's a hole from the inside leading out. And they later found the hikers scattered over a mile away from the tent. Um, all of them were insufficiently co uh, clothed for sub-zero temperatures. Um, the majority of them didn't have on the proper shoes. Some had violent injuries. Um, one was missing a tongue. So again, what baffled me is how could it be over 50 years and nobody understands or has figured out the events leading to their deaths. So I started researching everything I possibly could here, Googled like crazy, and I only came up with a certain amount of information that I didn't feel was sufficient. So I thought, how can I further this story, further my investigation? So I found a, a man by the name of Yuri Kuznovich in Russia, who's the head of the Dyatlov Foundation called him with the translator, and he didn't know me from anybody else. And uh, we talked for like 20 minutes. And he, he really didn't give me much information. Um, but in the end, he said, if you really want to know more about this story, come to Russia. So I hung up the phone. <laughs> and I thought, oh, shit. He just basically, it was almost like a summons, you know? So. I talked to my girlfriend who was seven months pregnant at the time, which isn't the best time to go to Russia. <laughs> and uh, she said, you got to go. So basically, I had two people saying I have to go. So I actually had to go. 
and I uh, jumped on a plane and you know I had no idea what I was stepping into. When I got there uh, to Yekaterinburg, I lived with Yuri Kuznovich and his family and ended up uncovering a trove of materials, the hikers journals, the hikers recovered photos, the criminal case, which the attention to detail back then was extraordinary. And I also started to get introduced to the friends and family of the hikers and the search teams and started to uh, interview them. And that's when the story began to feel real. It was no longer a myth or a rumor or this thing that I didn't understand. It started to become real to me at that point. Nice. What was it like actually interviewing some of the family members of the hikers? Um, it was a great experience because that's when I, I knew I had a story. And I started learning about the hikers that, that, you know, it was the height of the Cold War, but some of them were poets. Some of them were musicians. And they were these gentlemen adventurers, you know, and there was this sense of innocence that existed that I don't think exists anymore today. And they would go off into the woods for pure escapism. And sometimes just to recite forbidden poetry, if you can imagine that, or just to play songs that are forbidden. They would memorize hundreds of songs. So this great story started to materialize, and I became as interested in the hikers as I was the actual tragedy itself. But as I was interviewing the search and rescue teams, I was also putting together the story of the investigation and um, all the details that followed with that. Wow. Um. And tell us about the hikers. Um, did they actually have sufficient experience and skills to actually go on such a trip? The hikers were very experienced, highly educated. Um, most were engineers. Um, these weren't university stu students going out, getting drunk, partying. <laughs> they uh, were doing it for all the right reasons, in my opinion. And. Um, they were actually working towards a, a class, uh, class three hiking license, which is the equivalent of a master of sport. And they were at level two. So they would have to do a certain amount of, cover a certain amount of area and do a certain amount of things in order to get this level three. And that was what their final expedition was into the Northern Ural Mountains. And um, they specifically would challenge themselves and put themselves in dangerous situations and extreme situations and sub-zero temperatures and remote areas simply for the task of challenging oneself. And they would also chart, you know, uncharted areas for Google Maps and, and all that stuff. So they would go out there and actually collect data for their university and come back and give it to them simply to chart the area. You know, so I found that really compelling as well, just the innocence of it, you know, and, and just the camaraderie and um, as I said, I, there was kind of like these Jack London type characters, and, and they were very respectful. And, you know, they, there was love interest within the group, but they were gentlemen. And they would, there was two, two girls. They would never show that love interest because the goal was to conquer the distance and not let any of the personal stuff get in the way. So, you know, I just I really admired that. I thought, I thought that's pretty great. Why do you think that Yuri Yudin, who was the only survivor who hadn't spoken for so long, would talk to you, who was an American from who knows where? Yeah, yeah, Yuri Yudin, wow. Um, Yuri Yudin was the only surviving hiker uh, that turned back halfway, uh, you know, never saw his friends again. He had eluded journalists and reporters for over 50 years. And, um, you know, I'd always wondered, does he have survivor's guilt? Um, but I knew he held the answers to the stories in between the hikers' journals and all the photos. And he's the only one that could tell that story. So um, ignorantly, I thought somehow I could find him. And after two years, I thought, I'm not going to find him. But on my second trip there, um, I found out that he was there. And um, big moment for me. And I'm going, and you know, I finally sit down to do an interview with him, and the translator's late. So we just sat there and had tea for 40 minutes and stared at each other, and I couldn't talk to the man. 
And finally, the translator shows up. And the first question he says is, um, don't you have mysteries in your own country? <laughs> so I'd come all this way, and he hits me with that question, and uh, totally not prepared for that. And um, he had a good point. Of course, we got mysteries here. Why do I care? You know, I'm not Russian. But um, he told me to turn off my Cold War tape recorder. So I turned that off, and then he proceeded to interview me for a good 40 minutes before I could interview him. But once that trust was established, um, he opened up over two weeks and told me his personal story, his background, his childhood, and told me the story about these hikers and these expeditions that they would do. And it was sort of like this sort of cold weather motorcycle diary style adventures that they would have. And um, in this final expedition, you know, they stopped at a school to tell stories and sing music, and they stopped at a woodcutting settlement and stayed up all night, not partying and drinking, but playing music and reciting poetry. And to me, I was just shocked. I, I had no idea that was going on. So he was such an important part of the book to be able to fill all that in. And um, it was really endearing. Every night he would say to me, I'm praying for you. And he was praying for me because he was worried about me going on this expedition. And it was very endearing. It was also scary as hell when I would lay down at night because I would think, why is this guy praying for me? You know, is it really that dangerous? I know it's remote, but um, it was an honor for me to interview him and in that he gave me his story of all people. And uh, unfortunately, ended up dying um, shortly after I interviewed him. So... You know, I consider that a, a small piece of history that uh, for some reason he told me about. How do you think you were able to get his trust? I don't know. You know, I think part of it was just crazy American uh, <laughs> went all that way to go over there and um, to give it a shot and to try to get him to talk and that someone... I think maybe, too, it was I wasn't as focused about the tragedy as I just wanted to know about his friends and who they were as people, not Russians, not, you know, it doesn't matter the Cold War, just who were they as people? Tell me stories about them. Because I wanted to be able to develop a relationship with them as well as the readers to be able to develop a relationship for them because you have to care about them in order to want to be a part of this story. So. What was it like actually retracing the hiker's journey? Well, you know, I got to a certain point where I figured out if I'm truly going to tell this story, I have to literally and figuratively walk in their footsteps. So I decided I'm going to retrace their footsteps uh, the best I could. And um, it was a surreal experience because years ago, I grew up in... Florida, I've been in Southern California 17 years. I would never imagine I would be there, you know, at the gateway of Siberia in 25 below zero. Um, and for what? I didn't really know at that point. But to be able to go to those places, to go to the school and to go to Ivdel, where all the gulags were that they wrote about in their, in their diaries, and to go to Ushima, which is a Manzi village where the indigenous people live, they were right near there. And to basically go from their dorm to the place on the mountaintop where they had set their tent. It, for me personally, it was extraordinary. And um, one big thing that I realized is, as you could see in the, the trailer, is to walk a mile is extremely difficult in daylight with the best gear I could possibly buy to be warm. Because the terrain there, it goes from a few inches of snow to this much snow in a footstep. So it's very, very hard to walk. And to think that these hikers left their tent at, at night insufficiently clothed without footwear um, and walked a mile, that's when I thought, wow, this had to have been something that they thought it was safer to leave the tent than to stay in the tent. 
but to also just stand there and look down into the cedars where they died. And, um, you know, it, it was an extraordinary experience for me. And, and um, hopefully that's what I've uh, portrayed in the book. Did you have some people locally help you or escort you during any of the hiking? I did. I had Yuri Kutsnovich, who was the head of the Diallo Foundation, um, and two other people that came along, Vladimir Borzenkov, who was a scientist. Um, all the people were a little bit in their golden years, so that was kind of interesting uh, going with those guys. And um, Yuri Yudin didn't come along, which, again, kind of worried me a bit. But uh, he just said, farewell. <laughs> and uh, he had that look like, I may not see you again. Um, but, you know, it was a great experience. The, the, my first trip to Russia, they made me an honorary Boy Scout before I left. And <laughs> it may not sound like a big thing here. I wasn't a Boy Scout, but I was in, te <coughs> I was in tears because, you know, they gave me a, a pin and taught me the handshake and, it was a real honor. So that was a continuation when I did the expedition of the camaraderie. And I put my life in their hands. And, you know, I had a one-year-old at home on that second expedition. So um, I by no means climbed to the top of Mount Everest. But where I went was very remote. And if something happens there, I'm 30 hours away from the nearest third world hospital. So. I put my trust in their hands and, uh, you know, in your fellow human being. And um, it was a great experience. My translator on the trip wasn't that great, so a lot of times I didn't really know what the hell was going on. <laughs> and I had my camera, my video camera, and I would flip the screen backwards, and it sounds maybe a bit weird, but I, through the experience, I would just talk into the screen and just see myself, but just have someone to connect with. You know, and I later showed it to my girlfriend, and she's just like, wow, I don't know if I would show some of this stuff to people, because it <laughs> looks like you're losing your mind talking to yourself. But, you know, I just needed a connection to talk to be, as I'm going through all this, because a lot of times I couldn't really talk to people, so wow. it was cool. That sounds super intense. Yeah. Um, it sounds like through a lot of the interviews and your travel, you got a pretty deep sense for just Russian culture and a lot of interesting parts of Russian history because you talked to a lot of people who've, who had gone through and experienced a mm -hmm. bunch of different eras of Russian history. Are there some interesting takeaways or things that you, th things that really stuck with you? Um, not, not, not necessarily related to the story of the incident, mm -hmm. but just in general. Well, you know, I bought these boots before I left called uh, Arctic Pro, and I don't want to give away the company because I don't want to bag on them, but um, these boots before I left, I was so confident. They were supposed to be for 50 below zero temperatures, and I went and had lunch with my two friends. And I made them try on the boots, and I'm like, I'm going to be fine. Look at these boots. So I get there to Russia, and they called them elephant boots. And uh, they were laughing at them, and they had these things. I think they're called Valentis, Valenkis. And it's just basically a wool covering that looks like something, a woolly mammoth foot or something. It's the craziest looking thing, but they wanted me to wear those. And I insisted to wear my Arctic Pro boots. So we're out there, and my feet start sweating because they're not breathing. And I feel my two toes start to freeze together. And I'm like, uh-oh, I, I think I have a problem. And um, you, know, you can't take your boots off, really, in 25, 30 below zero. So I said to Vladimir, um, you know, through the translator, roughly, I have a problem. My toes are freezing together. And he said, welcome to Siberia. <laughs> <laughs> so that, uh, the end takeaway to answer your question is when in Russia, listen to the Russians because they know what they're talking about. Nice. That's good advice. Um, talk about your process in actually putting the book together. Uh, well, after my second trip to Russia, I came back. Uh, the interesting thing was I never even had a book deal on my second trip. I financed the expedition on my own, you know, spent all my savings, which, um, again, I had a one-year-old, no book deal, going to Russia, dropped all the savings. But I got back, and I got the book deal, luckily. And um, I put together this command center of 
sort of all the photos in, in my, inside my garage. And I put a timeline of all the hikers' photos and all the criminal case photos, search and rescue, and put it in chronological order and just started working out the story from all the interviews I had done. And then I started interviewing uh, Russian scholars and survival experts, avalanche experts, um, and going through every true theory that might have happened and ruling them out till I had nothing and freaked out because I didn't have an end to the book. And um, I went and met with scientists at NOAA in uh, Colorado, and um, they helped me to push through and find a good conclusion nice. without losing my mind. Nice. Um, speaking of conclusions, uh, what really did happen to the hikers? Well, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I'm a filmmaker primarily, so my first book. So I consider this book like a film. So. I can't give away the ending. Um, yeah. And I'm not being coy at all because I've got a little flack with some other things like, how can you not tell us? And I'm like, man, I spent four years. I can't just give it away that easy. Like, read it. But I will say this. Um, the lead investigator, Lev Ivanov, his final conclusion was an unknown compelling force. And that was the only case, an unknown compelling force. Mm -hmm. So. That was the only case that he ever had that was unsolved. And what I learned is that he actually was pretty damn close, considering he didn't have the technology and the science. And the conclusion that I came up with, with the scientists at NOAA, completely caught me off guard. And I could have only arrived at this conclusion with modern science. So um, I would love to know what you guys think, but I think it's a pretty logical explanation. Nice, thank you. We can open it up to some of your questions, and I'll have a handheld mic that I'll give to you guys. Why you decided to undertake an a, a adventure like doing book? Like, what motivated you? Is like, do you have people who help fund it? Why are you crazy enough to <coughs> spend all this time, you know, flying around yeah. to write a book? And you know, what's I want to hear your story, your backstory. Yeah. Well, um, my backstory and why I would do this, um, I'm a bit ignorant and stubborn, to be honest. Um, but I also really wanted to know about these hikers. And I felt like there has to be a story there behind these nine, ten hikers. So that's where the root of it started. I have a documentary background. And um, I have a personality as well as once I get on something, I become a bit obsessive. Uh, which isn't always a great thing, but um, for some reason I decided that uh, I could at least dispel all the false theories in this and highlight the story of the hikers. And I thought that people would find it interesting and also the people in Russia that never knew what happened, I never thought I would give them complete answers, but I could shed a light on a good possibility of what happened. And maybe they could have a little better closure with their lives, seeing a factual account of what happened to their loved ones. Very basic. Uh, why did you decide to make it into a book rather than maybe trying to pursue it as a... Sorry? So why did you try to make it, why did you make it into a book rather than say, decide to make a documentary about it? Like well, you know, on the first trip, that was my full intention. I, I filmed everything to make a documentary, but um, it's a very complex story. And um, it's also a Russian story. So I wasn't quite sure how I would do that because I wanted Westerners to know the story. I didn't want to just make a documentary that would be in Russian. But I started realizing the story's so complex, I better do a book first and get all the facts down and, and get their stories down. And then I have a platform to make a film. Um, how was this all perceived in Russia? Like, I think in the trailer, it, you compare it to the, the Kennedy assassination, which is pretty infamous here. Are you now infamous in Russia? Like, what kind of 
or is this book being translated to Russian? What kind of efforts are be, or what kind of stories behind that? Um, good question. You know, in Russia, uh, first of all, it hasn't been translated into Russian yet. But um, so there really hasn't been a response yet. The book's only been out about two and a half weeks. But the people that I worked with there, there was a big response while I was doing it just because somebody was out trying to separate fact from fiction. Because from my understanding, the, all, the, all the Russians that I interviewed, they have a complete distrust of government there. And pretty much everyone thought the government had covered something up. So they feared for my safety as well, just you know, carrying around government documents and stuff. But um, as far as their response, I don't know what it is yet. I only know in a small community. Um, but I'm really excited for when the book is translated into Russian to get their response. And, and I hope it's well received. Um, you know, I did my best job I could of telling an accurate story, one that's not jaded, but one that's also not perfect as far as me going there and solving a mystery. It's, it's not that. It's me going there as an armchair investigator and embedding myself and seeing the story that presents itself. So what were some of the conspiracy theories about this story? Uh, theories or conspiracy theories? Or both? Um, yeah. Um, well, you know, aliens, of course, because uh, you can never prove that. Um, the top theories were avalanche, um, that the hikers had stumbled upon a weapons testing area that perhaps they shouldn't have seen. Uh, the hikers had gone to a religious site of the local indigenous tribe there, the Monsies, and the Monsie killed them. Uh, there was even a story that the, the CIA was involved in. Um, Another theory actually was that uh, people had escaped from a gulag and went out there. But you know, a lot of these things, some of them were a little bit more simple, like the gulag. First of all, you're in the middle of nowhere, and the nearest gulag is 60 miles away. So they had, obviously, fences there with barbed wire and guards that would shoot them. But the thing is, where are you going to go? You're in the middle of Siberia. If you leave that compound, you're dead. So to think that prisoners would go 60 miles on foot, you know, and then arrive at their tent site and kill nine hikers, for what? So a lot of theories, really, when I started to, to get into it and the true facts of it, um, I could cross them off pretty quickly. But uh, I, maybe I forgot to mention, there were light orbs seen in the sky. And this was in the criminal case file. And that was one of the other things that I thought, uh-oh, OK, I'm not, I don't believe in UFOs, but there's 30 people interviewed that all saw light orbs on the same days. And um, there's something there. So I dug into it deeper, and I explained what those light orbs were in a logical fashion through science. Um, so you know. It was frustrating at times because there were all these theories, but once I started clearing them out, the real frustrating thing was I got nothing, you know. And um, then working with Noah, uh, it was it was just a godsend. Does that answer your question? Okay. So I haven't read this book yet, but you know we obviously know it's the Blair Witch. <laughs> <laughs> Can you at least tell us what happened to the guy's tongue? Um. Sure. This was one of the things that drew me in as well. Uh, there was a girl named Luda, and she was actually the outspoken one of the group. So some would say her tongue was cut out because she spoke too much as a warning to other people. Um, don't talk about this. We'll cut your tongue out as well. But the fact of the matter is she fell into a ravine. And she was upside down in the ravine. She was there for quite a long time. And the snow starts to melt, and there's a stream. So she's upside down. And that's the part 
of uh, her body that's in the stream and there's little organisms that are in the stream for sitting that long that eat away the fleshy parts of the face and the tongue is very fleshy so that's what it was it's the microbes why did you feel compelled to uh, find a conclusion when all other theories had failed why did you feel that you had to come to a conclusion you know, like say, for example, in the movie The Zodiac, you didn't see a conclusion other than, oh, here's this book that we never solved. Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, I got, I, I was sort of on autopilot at a certain point. I've got the hiker's story and I put the whole criminal case into a linear fashion so it unfolded as a story. So what do you do from there? And that's when I started ruling out all the different theories, working with scientists and different experts. So by process of elimination, I eventually reach a point where I've proven these theories don't work. So the only logical thing to do then is to try to crack it and try to find it. I by no means thought, started off doing this thinking, I'm going to crack this 50 plus year old mystery. But I thought I'm going to damn sure give it a try. And um, the way it's presented in the book, I, I'm not saying this is it, this is the end all. It's here is my theory and a group of scientists. Uh, we agree this is perhaps what happened. And there's a recreation at the, the last chapter of the book that puts everything together sort of a la usual suspects where you see all these things that maybe didn't make sense, hopefully make sense of that final night. And, you know, you decide for yourself, is this it? Um, but you'll never, we'll never absolutely know. Uh, there is one thing we could do is go to the site and test it with science, which would be great. I would love to do that. So that's something perhaps in the future, but, um, you know, I didn't want to present a theory in the end or a conclusion that didn't leave any questions for people to question it. Ideally, you read the book, another person reads the book, you go have a beer and you debate it. You know, some things you might agree with, some you don't, but it is presented factually. And that was my goal, is to separate fact from fiction. The group of scientists you work with, can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, um, funny enough, you know, I, I literally was left with nothing. And um, I sent an email to Dr. Bedard at NOAA, and uh, he agreed to meet with me. And it's a government owned agency, so security's pretty tight there. But funny enough, when I arrived there to meet with all my data and all my materials, there was six Russians there, you know, all these Russian scientists. And they were all really curious as well. And I think that's the only reason why they ended up even working with me, because they had a Russian background. And once again, why is this American care? So we just started going through everything. And I, I was nervous going there, because I was worried they were going to not find anything either. And, and I thought I had a, a theory that was out there. But um, trying not to give away the theory. but. They went through the process of elimination as well, and they were extremely helpful, and um, I was honored to work with those guys. I'm no scientist, you know, and uh, to be there working with them and then giving me the time for a book uh, it was amazing, and it was a, a really great experience and a humbling experience, too. These guys dedicate themselves to um, some pretty extraordinary things. Any other questions? Um, if not, Donnie's happy to stick around and sign some books. In the meantime, thanks so much for coming. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate it.